This video is kindly sponsored by Exter. Stick around at the end to find out more. Welcome to another supplemental, folks. This is my more loosely scripted show, as you know. Uh, today we are once again arbitrarily ranking something from Star Trek, this time the movies themselves. Now, this may kind of spoil what I'm gonna be saying about these movies in my retrospective series, but I feel like a big part of the value of those videos is the behind-the-scenes info, which is what I spend most of my time on in those videos anyway, and the opinions I'll be stating in this video will be, well, better expressed and, and uh, written with more clarity. Uh, for those videos. So with that out of the way, here is my ranking of the Star Trek movies from worst to best, which undoubtedly loads of people will disagree with, uh, but let's get started. So bottom of the pile, the worst, if you've seen my other videos you'll know what it'll be, it's Star Trek Insurrection. Uh, this wouldn't this shouldn't be surprising um, to those who have seen my video essay, which is literally titled Why Insurrection is the Worst Star Trek Movie. Um, I should say though, I don't actually hate any Star Trek movie, I think they're all kind of watchable. You know, there, there's far, far worse movies out there, you know, that, that make you actively angry while you're watching it. And, um, you know, some people may have that reaction to certain Star Trek movies. I never have. I have enjoyed watching all of them at some point or another, even if I favour um, some over others. But my issue with Insurrection um, is very, it's very bland. Uh, the Baku are just the blandest, most boring alien race. They're like so uninteresting and considering that a lot of the plot, you know, about the forced relocation of these people hinges on, you know, liking these people, the fact that they're so boring and that they just look like ordinary humans and they all just wear beige and, and they're just so uninteresting is like, it really kind of lets the entire story down. But as I said in my video essay, what I feel like makes it worse is that it really just fundamentally seems to misunderstand what Star Trek is about. Um, I pointed out in my video essay, it has a very cut and dry nature versus technology theme, which I feel like is really dumb, where it favors nature and, you know, what's natural is is uh, what's better and the technological side is evil. And it's woven throughout the, the film in a lot of different ways. And I feel like it's really dumb, you know. Um, I've always maintained that the core theme of Star Trek is human empathy keeping pace with technology. You know, I always use the replicators as an example that um, Star Trek is, is a future where replicator technology is used to cure world hunger and to uh, make sure no one lives in poverty and, you know, cures all those diseases and things like that. Whereas if human empathy hadn't kept pace with that technology, you know, the replicator would have been used to sell for profit, you know? Um, and that's what I think the core theme of Star Trek is about, is empathy keeping pace with technology so that Technology can be used to make everyone's lives better uh, rather than just kind of making profit for a select few. And I feel like Insurrection just doesn't really get that. And it's on the cusp of a much more interesting idea with um, a means justifying the ends uh idea, um, where the Admiral, obviously, he wants to use the radiation from the planet to uh, cure billions of diseases and make everyone better, and some people point out that the Dominion War was going on at the same time, so it could have been used to help in that effort as well, but, you know, the question is, is that goal worth uh, ruining the lives or potentially, you know, killing uh, hundreds of peaceful people? You know, I think that's an interesting idea, and I don't think the Sona really need to be there. I think if it was sort of a Starfleet versus Starfleet film, it would have been a bit more interesting. So I feel like not only does, is Star Trek Insurrection very bland and very boring, not only do I think it understands a core theme of Star Trek, but I also feel like it was just a big missed opportunity. You know, with a, with a title like Insurrection, where the crew of the Enterprise would commit treason, it's just not nearly as, as biting or impactful as it should be. Next on the list, second worst, is Star Trek V The Final Frontier, uh, which at the time of recording is uh, the one I've, the retrospective video I've just recently released. Um, again, I think overall this is kind of watchable. Uh, there are some very cringeworthy moments in it, but I've had good times watching it on occasion. Um, I think I rank this one above Insurrection because I feel like this one does get the spirit of Star Trek right. There is a kind of pioneering spirit of uh, wanting to go out into the cosmos and answer the most profound questions. It's a very human-centric idea, but it's just very poor in its execution. Um, the script is kind of all over the place and very messy. Uh, the plotting is very poor and it doesn't really explore those big themes in any kind of satisfying way. Um, this film, I think, uh, there were like there was like 20 minutes re uh, removed from it uh, by the studio because they wanted to kind of uh, do a thing where 
uh, the shorter the movie, the more showings they can get uh, in a day, and therefore the more profit they can make. But it's always a kind of self-defeating uh, prophecy because obviously, if removing that material it makes a worse movie, then people aren't going to see it, and it doesn't matter how many showings you can do a day, if people aren't seeing them, you're not going to make money. You know. Um, so I feel like Star Trek V was really a, a victim of that. Um, but there are some good things in here. You know, a lot of people point to that scene where Cyborg shows them all their pain, and you get that great scene from DeForest Kelly about uh, where Doctor McCoy's father and how how he euthanized him and things like that. Um, so there's there are good stuff, good good things in this movie. Um, but yeah, on the whole, it just it just didn't really stick the landing and uh, really missed the mark in a lot of ways. Next on the list, third worst is Star Trek Nemesis. Once again, I think this was a really good idea, but it's just bad execution. You know, I think the idea of a nature versus nurture and Picard confronting a younger version of himself is really interesting, and Tom Hardy especially. I think it's not really surprising based on the career we know he's had since then. Uh, but yeah, Tom Hardy is great in this film. Um, but what really lets Nemesis down is that it feels kind of self-conscious, like uh, being Star Trek isn't good enough and it's trying and failing to be really cool and dark and edgy and there's lots of like really gratuitous action in it, like uh, the whole buggy chase across the desert planet just doesn't need to be there and a lot of the kind of the shootouts in the uh, Reman Warbird where Picard's like dual wielding uh, like rifles and things, it's a bit silly and uh, there's also some very problematic elements like the whole um, Shinzon invading Troy's mind and, you know, doing uh, the R word, which I can't say because YouTube doesn't like it, but you know what I mean. It really doesn't need to be there and is very off-putting and very regressive in a lot of ways. And, you know, there, there, there's a whole video essay you could make just about that scene alone. You know, it's just really horrible. Um, but this is another film like Star Trek V. Uh, I'll go into the behind the scenes of this. I'm excited to get to this one with the retrospective series, actually, because the behind the scenes of this is is really just a mess. Um, where, once again, this was butchered in the edit, where Paramount was like, this film needs to be under two hours so we can get more showings uh, in, in each day. Uh, but it was also, like, up against, like the two towers at the box office and things. It was just really silly all around. But also the director, Stuart Baird, there's a difference between, like, Nicholas Meyer and J.J. Abrams, who weren't familiar with Star Trek before taking on the project, and then there's Stuart Baird, who was on record as saying he didn't like it, who had seen Star Trek and disliked it. So I don't know why they got him to direct the movie, and there's lots of stories where he didn't really know uh, what the, who the characters were and didn't know their names and kept getting the cast's names wrong and everything like that, and he didn't really want to direct the film, so I don't know why he ended up taking the job. Um, and because of that, because of what was missing from the film and because of the poor direction, um, a lot of character material is missing. Um, and while most of the action feels very crewboard in, the final battle is very good, and as I said, there's good elements like Picard and Shinzon and... You know, the rest of the cast, they do some good stuff, and Jerry Goldsmith's score, it's really fantastic, and um, once again, ILM just kind of knocks it out of the park visual effects-wise. But yeah, this is a real shame as as the last big big screen outing for the TNG crew. Now, next up, this, this is where it gets messy and where the idea of ranking things gets lost in the shuffle, but I'm going to jointly put... Star Trek Into Darkness alongside Star Trek The Motion Picture. And I know just by saying that, several people in the comments just flipped their shit. I know loads of people love Star Trek The Motion Picture, and loads of people hate Into Darkness with a vengeance. But if you allow me to explain, I feel like these movies are kind of mirrors of each other um, in terms of their quality. Like, Into Darkness has a very, very messy script. The plot's all over the place, and the twists are really stupid. Like, the whole Khan twist is just conceptually bad and really stupid. Um, but J.J. Abrams, for all of his faults, his talent, he has talent for making energetic, fast-paced, fun movies, you know, uh, which are very exciting. And it makes Into Darkness a decent popcorn flick. You know, if you want to see some explosions and some action and things and really turn your brain off, Into Darkness is pretty good for that. You know, um, so while, while on a scripting level it's pretty bad, it's, it's pretty good for just a, a popcorn flick. The motion picture, on the other hand, has a story which feels very thin for its runtime, and, you know, obviously people call it the slow motion picture, um, but also script-wise it's missing a lot of, like, the great character material that uh, would really endears the viewer to, to those films and those characters, but 
obviously it's visually spectacular and it's got some really big, really fascinating ideas in it. Uh, it's all surrounding V'ger and the nature of existence and purpose and so on and so forth. So it's really cool in that regard. And that's why I think these movies are kind of mirrors uh, of each other and why I kind of rank them jointly is that Into Darkness is like the best possible execution of just a foundationally bad idea, whereas the motion picture had a great idea, but it just could have been executed better. And that's why I kind of rank them jointly, but I know loads of people will uh, have a big problem with that. Next on the list is Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. I know many people rank this much higher. Um, it's certainly loads and loads of fun, and it's a well-made film, and it accomplishes what it sets out to do. I just don't find it all that special, and I prefer outer space Star Trek adventures. I've said in my retrospective, I get why people love this movie, I get why it's often ranked so highly, but just based on purely my personal preferences, I just prefer a different kind of Star Trek. Uh, this is never one, when I'm in a big Star Trek mood where I, where I want to uh, marathon a bunch of movies or, or really get back into some Star Trek stuff. The Voyage Home never springs to mind as one that I immediately want to watch. I always go for uh, one of the other movies. You know, this is one of the ones which um, it doesn't spring to mind immediately as being uh, particularly iconic or all that great. Even though I know for a lot of people uh, that's not the case. But just based on my own personal preferences, I don't like it as much. That's why above it is Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Um, as I said, this is my preferred kind of Star Trek with a, an outer space adventure, and this one has loads and loads of fun set pieces, like uh, the whole stealing the Enterprise bit, and the destruction of the Enterprise itself is awesome, and the fight scene at the end between Kirk and uh, Krug uh, on the uh, Genesis planet as it blows up is really good. Um, the villain as well, I think Christopher Lloyd is excellent in this movie. Even though the character uh, is a little bit two-dimensional, could have been written with a bit more depth, um, I think Christopher Lloyd really acts the shit out of the character and does a really good job. Um, but as I said in my retrospective of this film, I just think bringing back Spock from the dead um, is just a bad idea. Um, I know it would have changed loads of later Star Trek, like he wouldn't have had um, the unification parts 1 and 2 and it would have affected the later movies going forward, but Considering just how well the character was killed off in The Wrath of Khan and how poignant that was and how moving, spending the entire next movie just kind of undoing that uh, just feels very redundant. And that's why uh, The Search for Spock has never been one that um, I really love, but I think is, is fine. Next up is Star Trek Generations. Now, I know a lot of people don't like this one, but I actually have to confess, I, I love this movie. I think it's really great. Um, I understand a lot of the hate that this movie gets surrounds the Kirk and Picard crossover. You know, it was hyped to hell. And if you look at the trailers as well, it's very deceptively edited to make it look like Kirk plays a much bigger part in the events. And, you know, there's rumblings of... Uh, earlier drafts of the script which had like Kirk taking command of the Enterprise D and that sounds really awesome and you know dying but going down fighting the Klingons and so on and everyone says like that such a huge missed opportunity and now just, and just kind of having him show up for like 15 minutes at the end and then getting killed with a bridge falling on top of him is super disappointing but and I understand that I think um, that's all totally legitimate criticism but I think divorced from the context there's a lot of really good stuff in this movie which kind of compensates for that for me at least anyway I think the themes surrounding confronting one's own mortality uh, are really, really strong and do echo the Wrath of Khan and that great material. And I think Sauron uh, is a really good villain and a great foil for Captain Picard because obviously, you know, Picard, uh, during that movie, he loses his entire extended family and he's worried about, you know, the, the Picard line ends with him and, and uh, you know, he wants to kind of turn back the clock and he has all these regrets and things and here comes Sauron who's like here's a gateway to a place where you can do all that and fulfill all those dreams and I think it's a really great dynamic between the two and the performances from McDowell and Patrick Stewart are really really awesome and on top of all that I think they really direct the shit out of it you know um, for a movie which basically reuses all the TV sets and all the TV costumes and has a lot of the TV team um, it feels big you know it feels really really epic for as small a scale as it is and i love dennis mccarthy's score for it i think it's directed very well i like the general feel of it i know that's kind of an inarticulate statement but i like the whole feel of generations i think it's always something which 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 has stayed with me and stayed in my mind and uh, a f friend of mine said it's the only Star Trek movie which makes a really good Christmas movie. You know, and I do get that, and that's that's what I kind of mean with uh, the feel of the movie. Um, but Generations, uh, I, I really, really, really love Generations. I think it's great. However, I am aware of its flaws 
uh, to such a degree that um, above this I'm putting Star Trek First Contact. Um, a lot of folk call this an action movie, but I've always found it closer to a horror movie. You know, there is that big opening battle against the Borg Cube, which is great, but the rest of it is a much more contained, tense battle in the Enterprise, with you know, in the corridors and the bowels of the ship and so on. And that stuff's really, really good. And yeah, Jonathan Frakes, the mileage he gets out of directing that stuff is like, uh, you know, the fact that after Insurrection he was kind of relegated to a TV director again is a real shame because the guy's got heaps of talent behind that camera you know he really really uh, does a great job for that film um but despite the film's darkness and how kind of horror like it can be and how uh, kind of gory it can be as well with all the borg implant stuff um it still manages to be very very optimistic and very funny you know all the stuff going on uh, on the planet's surface with dr cochran is really great and uh it's it's kind of quintessential star trek it's a real crowd pleaser um where it's you know it, it does what um, I talk about with uh, modern Star Trek, where a lot of people accuse modern Star Trek of being too dark, and I've always said, but the darkness is in service of the ultimately optimistic message. It's like, you know, despite uh, the Borg traveling back and the Borg assimilating the Enterprise and killing off, you know, most of the crew and things like that, you know, despite all these struggles, they still end it on a real optimistic high note, and uh, that's what I find really enjoyable about First Contact and uh, why why it's, uh, I think, one of the best. Now, the next four... Um, I think are all interchangeable in terms of my ultimate favourite. So although I have ranked these on my Letterboxd uh, profile, follow me on Letterboxd, by the way, if you want to know my opinions on other things other than Star Trek, um, even though I've ranked these in order, these all kind of swap around in my head in terms of what's the best and what's better than the other and things. So the next four that I mentioned, I think, I'm not calling any one of them the best, these are all just kind of my f four favorites as a better way of thinking about it which is star trek 09 the undiscovered country beyond and the wrath of khan i love all of these um i think 2009 is a great reboot it's super fun the cast are all really great it's also really exciting to see this established universe move in a new direction you know i really miss how bold uh, the storytelling is in this film, you know, that they destroy Vulcan and they have uh, Spock get with Uhura and things. It's really exciting and it made you kind of think, well, they can do anything now. And that's what made Into Darkness all the more disappointing. The fact that they're just, they're just kind of remaking Space Seed and smashing it into, um, into Dark uh, and smashing it into the Wrath of Khan is really disappointing. And that's what I find uh, rewarding when I go back and watch 2009 is because it has that sense of excitement that they could do anything, you know, after this. And uh, because of that, I, I really, really like it. And it's really, it's a, such a interesting, refreshing departure from all the Star Trek that had come before it. Some people hated it, of course, but I really, really liked it because, precisely because of how bold it was being. Um, Undiscovered Country is just a wonderful swan song. Um, at the time of recording this, I've just finished editing my retrospective on the Undiscovered Country, and I think it's, it's just brilliant. It's made me, it's made me appreciate that movie a whole lot more. I think it just embodies everything that's great about that original cast and their adventures. Um, Beyond feels like it. Sh Beyond feels like it should have been the first sequel to O9. As I said, Into Darkness kind of. Uh, is disappointing because it just repeats and just pulls from past Star Trek and does it all again when it set the stage for doing something new and fresh and exciting. And I feel like that's what Beyond should have been. Um, Beyond should have been the follow-up to that film because at the end of 09, of course, they go off and they're exploring and going where no man has gone before. And then in Beyond, they're doing that. And I feel like you could just kind of cut out Into Darkness altogether and had Beyond been the second film that came out, I feel like, you know, maybe we would have, maybe we would be on Star Trek 4 and 5 by now. Who knows? And, you know, so there's a kind of a kernel of... Uh, of um, melancholy about Beyond, but I think it's really enjoyable, and um, as I said in my video essay on that film as well, I think it's great that it's the one Star Trek film where it's the classic characters actually in their prime, actually going off and exploring where no one has gone before. You know, I said before how most of the other movies are all um, uh, kind of after the fact, and all the characters are all past middle age and they're all uh, you know it's after all the adventures that they had in the tv shows and uh, and they're kind of it's all all the movies are kind of confined to the federation you know whereas the core of star trek is exploring and, and going where no one's gone before and beyond it's why i love that movie so much is that they actually are going off and exploring and going to strange new worlds and encountering strange new life but it's on a 
blockbuster budget and it's with you know fantastic state-of-the-art special effects and amazing production design and i feel like um it's theme is it's themes as well about um you know finding your place in unity uh versus uh kind of individuality and so on again really embody star trek you know um i think simon pegg writing it because of course simon pegg's a massive trekkie um simon pegg really knows his stuff when it comes to star trek and you can clearly see that reflected in the script which is why i think beyond is so fantastic and obviously we have the wrath of khan um i feel like i don't need to explain why this is a great movie all that much uh, we've all we all know that wrath of khan's brilliant and it's been written about in countless publications and essays and even my own retrospective um the character writing for kirk is excellent khan as a villain is awesome it has brilliant space battles um yeah this film's just awesome um now i know a lot of trekkies will hate some of the choices that I've made, I expect to see a lot of comments ranking about ranking Into Darkness jointly with the motion picture, and why that makes me a shill or not a real fan, etc, etc. Like all rankings and all art, it's purely subjective. Uh, this was just my perspective, and I hope some of the more open-minded viewers found my reasoning interesting, even if they don't agree. This video has been kindly sponsored by Exter, the world's largest makers of smart wallets, which they have kindly gifted me for this video. There's a huge selection to choose from in many different colours, all made with premium leather. The wallets come equipped with this cool card access mechanism, which kind of reminds me of the classic TOS communicators, but an even more valuable feature in my opinion is the ability to track your wallet. Each one comes equipped with this super slim solar powered tracking device, which allows you to see where your wallet is at all times from your phone, and should you ever lose it, you can simply ring the tracker to help you find it. Click the link in the description to get yours. Doing so would also help this channel out loads. I'm certainly happy with mine, so I hope you check them out too. Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members, where you can see videos early as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, Live long and prosper.